Hi, this is Mike Brown, owner of Death Wish Coffee Company. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. I love Java, Death Wish Coffee presents Fueled by Deathcast, the world's strongest podcast. With your hosts, the incredible Jeff and the amazing D Man. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. This is episode 115 for those of you that are not keeping track nobody's, at home. Nobody's keeping track at home. <laughs> Never. They don't have to because you're telling them what every episode is. It is true. It and is true. this one's a doozy. This one is a doozy. We've been waiting very, very long to bring this to you guys. We're really excited. So let's get right into it. I am the Incredible Jeff. And I am the Amazing D-Man. We'd love it if you followed us on social media. It's really easy to do. I am at Jeff Wish Coffee. And I am at Death Wish Dustin. And we got to shout out our good friend and the voice of death himself, Brock Powell. BrockVox.com and also at BrockVox on Instagram and Twitter, uh, Twitter and, and Facebook. Yep, and it will probably any other social media that comes Snapchat, out these days. MySpace, I heard, I've heard of a new one called Minds. My, I, haven't, I haven't checked it out yet, I though. I have not either. There's new ones popping up all the time because everybody's trying to compete with the these you know these closed source social medias. Everybody's coming out with open source social media. I don't know what any of that means. Me but if you are using Instagram... At Brock Fox. There you go. <laughs> and uh, we love Brock to death. Follow him for all the cool stuff that he does in the voice acting world. And if you missed it, back on episode 114, we had him on as a guest. And we had a great conversation about voice acting and all that kind of stuff. But we also love podcasts. And I want to take a second just to shout out some of our favorites. Um, friend of the show, also was a guest way back in the day, was Ricky Rackman, who also was the host of Headbangers Ball, and the guy behind the infamous Cat House. And uh, now he's got a podcast all about those crazy freaking days at the Cat House called Cat House Hollywood Podcast. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever podcasts are found. It's a lot of fun. Comes out every other week. And you get some really cool rock and roll stories right from right from the horse's mouth. And I'm not calling Ricky a horse. That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I want to uh, shout out another one of our friends who was also a guest on this show, Mr. Matthew Hendershot. He recently left the country and moved with his lovely wife to Germany and he's trying to make it out there and he's chronicling the whole thing with his new friends on his brand new podcast called I'll Take a Shot at That and I have a bump for you guys to hear right here. Hey everyone, my name is Matthew Hendershot. And I'm Jake. And I'm Justin. We are three Leipzig, Germany transplants kicking off a brand new podcast called I'll Take a Shot at That. My friends and I will be setting out on adventures and having conversations from the unique to the mundane. And we will be taking a shot at figuring out this crazy modern world. Basically, we'll be BBC, NPR, CNN, rolled into Fox one. Fox News. That too. <laughs> providing... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow your roll. Yeah, slow I think he's roll. got it. It's much more likely that what we're going to turn out to be is a room full of half-drunken idiots spreading a thick layer of bovine excrement over the news of the day and whatever oh, it is you feel like much talking better about. And more credible. I'll Take a Shot of That will be published weekly and is available on iTunes, Google Play, and all the other major publication platforms. We can also be found in all the best time-wasting social media out there like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at slash shot at that. I can't wait to get started. Let's get started. Certainly, I will take Let's a shot take a at shot that. that. I'll take Sweet. a shot of that. Yes. And they're definitely going to have a lot of fun because every single episode, not only are they going to talk about whatever pops into their brain, they're going to drink a lot of alcohol. And you know that weird German alcohol, yeah, too. Yeah, the good <laughs> alcohol. Yeah, I'm sure. So- I don't even know. I don't even know. Yeah. We're just we got, assuming. We're gonna go. Vi- we're gonna come visit, Matt. Yeah. If you're listening, we're coming to visit, and we'll we'll let all the viewers know how good that alcohol mm-hmm. really is. For sure, for sure. So definitely follow those podcasts and find your favorite podcasts out there and listen to podcasts because podcasts are awesome. Secret code unlocked. Discount of death. This week and well, hell, every week. Make sure to use our awesome podcast discount, Discount of Death, to get 12% off of everything on deathwishcoffee.com. I mean, you guys are already going to the website. You guys are, you know, buying coffee and merchandise. We see you out there. And uh, we just wanted to give you a way to save a little cash because... uh, we're constantly coming out with new stuff. I can't, I was just looking at the marketing calendar as I do every single week and it just 
constantly grows with more cool stuff. And you know what's better than cool stuff is cool stuff that's a little bit cheaper, exactly 12% cheaper. So as you're buying that cool stuff in your discount code area, all you have to do is type in one word. Well, it's three words, but we're smashing it into one word, discount of death, and 12% off just for you guys. Enjoy it. This week, guys, is really, really special. Um, We're getting to the end, the bottom of the barrel of the episodes that we recorded when we went on our incredible trip to Los Angeles last year. And as far as it goes in my book, it is a save best for last situation. Uh, Titus Welliver uh, (sighs) is one of the coolest people on Earth fucking earth if you the Bosch. Do, if you don't know who he is he has his own amazon prime show called Bosch, which is a, a detective who plays by his own rules yeah it's kind of it's drama but it's based off of a book series it gets a little meta it's totally fun but this guy has been in transformers yeah he's, he agents was, of shield uh sons of anarchy yeah lost i mean he's been in everything and it's for a reason because he's a killer and he's awesome and not only did he bring us in, a, in his home to have this awesome interview that you're about to listen to but he actually brought us on the set of Bosch. Oh, it was such an experience. I've never actually been on a real TV set before yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, that was crazy. And that was just amazing. And everybody, not only Titus, but everybody who works on that show are amazing. They were welcoming to us. They like, And they didn't have to be. They were all having a job to Hold do and get their job done. They had to be. We send them coffee constantly. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That is true. But but I mean, like, you know, they're all working hard. They're, you know, making sure the mics are good and the and the lighting's good and the director's in behind there and everything. But they yeah. all took time to talk to us. Yeah. Make sure we were cool. We even got to sit behind the director for a scene. That was amazing. It was amazing. But being able to talk with Titus about his career, his life, and what fuels him was one of the highlights of our trip. And I really cannot wait for you guys to dive into this episode. So mugs up this week for this week's death guest, Titus Welliver. The Fueled by Death Guest. What is it, buddy? Right, I got to work. You want to say something? <laughs> what is it like to be a cat? Yeah. 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 Tell me. Because <laughs> I'm not a pussy. Um, let's start with Bosch, though. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, that's, that's a perfect place to start in. Yeah. I mean... When uh, it, the question obviously you get a lot probably, but I, I'm dying to know. Um, were you a fan of the material before you were cast? Well, truthfully, I, it's not that I wasn't a fan, but I had only read one of the books, and it had been many, many years before. Yeah. So I got the script, and I, I read the script, and I was kind of, you know, it's it's the blessing and the curse of a good script when you're an actor because. You don't want to want it too much because, right. of course, it's it's sometimes it's like the lottery. You know, yeah. you can you can get all the scratch tickets you want and still come up with Zero. nothing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but the script was so solid and the character was so kind of clearly defined, and I just went, yeah, this is sort of this is what I've been looking for. And ironically, I had become a little bit not disenchanted, but I thought, you know, it was time. It came right at a time when I had just had a horrible tragedy in my life. My late wife had had passed away from cancer, and suddenly I was, you know, a single a single father. And I was thinking, I'd been traveling a lot because prior to that I had been doing The Town and Lost and Sons of Anarchy and The Good Wife all at the same time. Wow. So I was constantly going from one location to the next. Yeah. And my wife was still alive at that point, and she was holding the fort down. But I thought, how am I going to, I have to find something that's local. Yeah. And so in the interim, I had written uh, a television pilot for myself. I just sat down and thought, let me write something that will have some sort of artistic, intellectual sustenance that, that, that will sustain me. Right. And of course, that's also a crap shooting. You can write the greatest pilot in the world and the networks and whoever will just say, yeah, it's great, but it's not for us. Right. And I was just at the point of going out with my manager and starting to shop this property when I got the Bosch script and I read it and I went, boy, I'd really like to, I'd love to do this. So through a series of mishaps, um, every time I was trying to make a meeting with Michael Connolly and the producers for, for the role, um, I, I lost my cell phone and something else happened and I was shooting Transformers, mm-hmm. Age of Extinction, and that was a lot of location stuff. I was in Chicago, I was in um, Michigan, and then in Hong Kong and all over the place. And so 
I don't know, it seemed like a couple months passed. And I got a call from my manager. I was back in L.A. for a hot minute. And he said, hey, uh, you're going to meet with Connolly on Tuesday. And I said, you know, oh, well, I thought that boat sailed. Wasn't that months ago? And he said, no, they can't. They can't find Bosch. They've they've read everyone and considered everyone they want, but Connolly will not go forward until they find the guy that suits him. Yeah. And, you know, l lucky for me, I went in and met with Michael and did my thing. And as he tells the story, I I left and and Mike Connolly turned to the producers and said, that was Harry Bosch, and that was that. Wow. And then it became kind of a scramble because we had a short window because I was finishing up Transformers in Hong Kong yeah. to jump in. So there was no time to really, um, you know, I mean, I played enough cops that I know how they operate, yeah. but it yeah, was, but, yeah. but they're all different. I mean, obviously each character is different. Mm. He was LAPD, he wasn't a New York cop or a Boston cop of which I'd played before. So there was none of that, you know, go for a ride along, hang out with the homicide detectives, do this right. and that. So I had to, you know, I, I asked Michael, what is the best way to get inside this guy's head? Which is the best book? And he said, we'll start with the one that we've chosen for this season. But these are the books. And he uh, very kindly sent me over all of the books that had been written up That's to awesome. that date, you know, first editions hard hard copies signed by him oh, wow. which was a treasure trove for me yeah. and of course he said i'm sorry about sending you all those books and i said why and he said well i could have just had you know amazon load them onto a kindle and i said oh <laughs> I, I don't i don't read books that way yeah i read books and they go on my shelf because chances are i'm going to pull that book off the shelf and go back and revisit it at right. some point so hence yeah. The multitude of shelves yeah. in this house. So that's how it all came to be. Wow. Well, I, I, I almost thought, like, they picked you right away because your personality seems to fit the character so well. How much of your own personality is like Bosch's personality? How much do you relate to Bosch? So you're saying that I'm, by nature, a taciturn... It seems like it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this this interview is over. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, you know what, uh, for me, I mean, the whole joy of acting for me is to try to kind of disappear into a role. Yeah. But, you know, the parallel to that is how do you disappear into a role and and when it's something steeped in reality like Bosch, you know, yeah. it's not Batman or something, yeah. how, how to make it uh, uh, feel as, as grounded and real as possible. Because I never want to get caught acting. I can't stand that. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, some roles are, are over the top, and they call for a, 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 a dramatic flair, and that's fine, but yeah. Bosch is not that character. Oh. Yeah. And that's the hardest part about playing him, because he's not really an emotionally demonstrative guy. He's, uh, he's not monosyllabic, but he really only speaks when he has something to say. Yeah. So there's, um, and of course in the books, it's told through the narrative of what he's thinking. And one of the tricks that I said to the guys was, I said, you know, when you find Bosch so often in the books and he's by himself, there's a kind of solitude and he's being contemplative but it's described in the narrative. Mm -hmm. But there's no dialogue. Right. Let's do that. And they, of course, were relieved because they wanted to do that. But, of course, you know, the age-old story is that actors want as much to say as they possibly can. Right. And to the challenge to that is, for me, to say as little as possible with dialogue, but to try to project that inner emotional life with him without speaking. And, and I would say that's the, you know, he's a guy who doesn't have a lot of affect, mm -hmm. which is also the other thing that's, that's really hard. How do you play a guy who doesn't want to be seen, um, right. but has to be it seen? Has to be. Is the main character. <laughs> and right. who is the central character yeah. to all that in, in, in his universe that he's bouncing off of. Uh -huh. And that, that's been the, the thing. I mean, my, myself, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of noisy and... and um, you know, I, 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 I am emotionally demonstrative. I, I'm, I'm a crier. I'm a yeller. I'm, you know, I, it's all kind of out on the plate. Um, although my kids will 
will say things. They'll watch a scene and there'll be a, a look or a gesture and they'll be, you know, mm, uh, yeah, I know oh, that guy's in trouble. I know <laughs> yeah. that look. Yeah, yeah, that's so, <laughs> so I guess you can't, one can't help but have some part of, of themselves, you know, you, you imbue the character with yeah. some level of your own affect, um, you know, not intentionally. And, you know, my sort of characterization of Bosch is kind of a, an amalgam of, of my father and um, and the writer producer David Milch, um, he, he is sort of a melding of that with a with a little bit of uh, something else thrown in there here and there. Yeah. Do you think the other side might be true? Do you think since you've portrayed this character, you've affected the author's take on the character in subsequent stories? Do you think he's changed because of your portrayal? I I, I don't think so. But I, that's a question for Connolly, right. and, and I would, and I would. The one thing that I that I would say as it relates to that is that um, what's nice is that when people who have, who had read the books before the show came yeah. along, and since the show has come out, have have said in, in in social media and when I when I meet them on the street, will say, you know, when I read the books now, I see I see your face and I hear your voice. Right. And that, of course, is is always the daunting thing about playing a character. Though it didn't, you know, repel. You know, it certainly didn't deter me in any way. Right. Because it fell on the heels of Tom Cruise being so maligned for being cast as Jack Reacher, and I thought, well, because the character's physicality is so so specifically, <clears throat> you know, detailed in the Reacher books as being, you know, six, six foot feet. five yeah. and 285 <laughs> and just massive muscle. And Tom Cruise is not a tall guy. Yeah. I mean, he's in phenomenal shape. Yeah. But I think, you know, I've read the Reacher books. I'm able to sort of divorce myself, yet we yeah. all kind of have that prejudice when we read a book. Yeah. We create that physicality. Totally. And within the Bosch books, there are really, there are very few physical descriptions of him it, um they you know Connolly describes him as having dark eyes mm -hmm. um i don't have dark eyes i have very light blue eyes but the thing to me is that harry's a haunted character and that's become however that happens maybe yeah. it's through osmosis that my brain clues my my eyeballs to do the right thing is that there's um to bring that quality of a guy who's kind of seen too much, you know, it's not yeah. it's not the thousand yard mm -hmm. stare, but there's a kind of there there is a loss of color and 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 hence, you know, um, vibrance to to his eyes, and he's described as being kind of wiry and having tousled hair, and that's kind yeah. of it. And I'm sure, you know, I mean, and, and, and in the beginning, I was asked that question by a lot of interviewers. They would say, you know, was that intimidating? And I kind of, you know, and the truthful answer was I thought, well, I'm an actor. And exactly. that's item A. And the source material was so good. It wasn't like I, I needed to reinvent this guy and make him something that he wasn't on the page because he, he's well realized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was to take all the, the essence of that character, his moral code and compass and, and, uh, and bring that to life on the screen because there's always going to be people. And I, I, you know, I'm sure they're out there, um, you know, uh, who absolutely cannot watch the show because they, they won't accept me as Harry Bosch, but I will say, that my experience has been um, in, in contact that I have with, with the fans of the books mm -hmm. has been really supportive. I mean, really supportive. And that for me, um, you know, that's, that makes me feel good because I yeah. feel like I'm on yeah. point yeah. Um, without, you know, without coming under too much attack. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're definitely on point. And I got I to gotta tell a little story. Um, on our, before we left here, I was telling my mother about this trip and she was like, Oh, who are you going to interview? And I was bringing up names and she doesn't really recognize anybody. And I brought up your name. She was like, Oh my God, you're going to talk to the Bosch. <laughs> <laughs> the Bosch. And she's like, I'm so jealous. And then she said something that stuck with me. And at the time I, you know, where it gets a little bit stressful sometimes and yeah. it's hard to, hard to stay cool all the time. And she said something then that kind of like resonated with me and I've been keeping with me a little bit, but um, she was like, everything gets so stressful for the Bosch, but he just keeps his cool all the time. And I'm like, 
He does keep his cool. <laughs> I want to be the boss. <laughs> yeah, I do too. <laughs> yeah. Has it mellowed you out playing that role at all? No, I'm no. sure. No, no it, it, it hasn't. That's good. I wish it could because, you know, that's the other thing is that, you know, the, uh, another question I'm asked a lot of times is because, you know, Harry deals with the, the darkest and most tragic moments in, in the course of people's lives. Totally. He sees the worst of it all. Yeah. And... You know, obviously, I'm not a cop. The subject matter is is heavy. Well, and so the people will say, "Wow, when you come home, do you, you know, do you have to have a drink?" And I go, "Well, I don't drink, so I've kind of used up my coupons with that. So no, I don't." I say, "But you know, there's there's a uh, there's a humanity to that character. And if you talk to any homicide cop, they'll tell you that there is a there's some kind of an emotional reserve that they have internally that allows them." to kind of get through it. But they all say, you don't do this work and not get touched. Hence, you have a lot of, you know, you have a high divorce rate, a lot of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. But I also know a lot of detectives who are squared away enough in that they have that survival mechanism for their emotional life, that they're able to separate themselves enough from that so that when they're with their loved ones and navigating everyday life, that they're not overly touched by that that it doesn't allow them to be able to be present well i could be speaking out of turn but it seems like to me that the one way that they get through that is that they're the ones that keep the bad men from the door right you know and and that would be the the payoff the equalizer to dealing with the like i have to keep myself separated from this because i need to make sure that this doesn't happen again and that's the feeling i get from bosch's character um, through the whole season is just like he deals with a lot of shit but he has to keep his cool well he you know that's the thing you can't he, he doesn't go untouched by it and the, you know I remember a line I think in the first season where where he, he sort of addressed that he said you know uh, homicide work is after the fact someone's been killed and we show up and it's our job to figure out who and how they did it because you know there's another line that Bosch says where somebody makes a reference to closure for the family and Bosch says closure is a myth yeah and it's true because all that Bosch can do and he is the conduit right he is that guy he can obtain justice he can't obtain closure because he can't bring the person back to life but he can secure justice for the victim and for their families which will never assuage their their pain and their loss yeah. but it the it will secure that that doesn't that person does not act out that kind of you know depraved indifference for human life and in that way i think yes you talk to homicide guys and they go when we get a bad guy or a bad bad woman mm-hmm. and lock them up for doing something heinous yeah we're happy about that. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, they're happy about just that part, that they can prevent that from ever, ha- ever happening again by that individual. It doesn't mean, but they can't necessarily prevent the architect of, of some other tragedy. Yeah. yeah. Gosh. Um, I have to ask this question. Throughout your career, you, like you mentioned, you have played a myriad of different police officers and cops and detectives and stuff like that. You've also played some questionable characters oh, yeah. and some and some 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 criminals. Do you gravitate towards one or the other more? Do you, do you or do you like being able to kind of like spread those wings? Well, I like to you know obviously I like to mix it up. I think anything and Bosch is probably the only character that I've ever played that has the kind of sustenance and longevity that I was speaking about before mm. um, as an actor. Connolly, when we first were doing the pilot, he said, "How long do you?" how long do you think you can play this character for? Because I've always talked about that, that I, you know, the, the pitfall of doing a television series is some people, they get tired of it. Right. Yeah. The yeah. character, whatever, the, the writing can falter mm-hmm. and they, they lose their interest in it. Right. But, I said to Connolly, I'll do this for as long as they'll have us. Yeah. Because he is a character while he doesn't um he doesn't necessarily evolve on some level. He evolves within the circumstances around him. Yeah. So he is 
not a guy who's ever going to become the happy-go-lucky, skipping and dancing guy. But, you know, his daughter being sort of the anchor, mm -hmm. that's the thing that sort of propels him forward outside of his work because he has something that he can step away from the darkness, something that's, yeah. that represents good yeah. and purity. And that's the thing that, that sustains him. Um, I think for the... The thing about playing bad guys for me is there's something really interesting about playing characters who don't play by the rules, mm -hmm. yeah. who are deeply, are so narcissistic that they operate, you know, at their core, it's all about serving self-interest. Right. And, and that narcissism creates a level of power, I guess, for lack of a better word. There's something about being, you know, a made guy in La Cosa Nostra who does and says whatever he pleases mm -hmm. and doesn't care yeah. and doesn't even really care about the consequences. And, and the, that's kind of interesting stuff to play. And then there are characters, you know, like the man in black and lost yeah. that, that whole, the whole mythology of that program was so rich that, you know, it was kind of sky was the limit. Yeah. And so I, I guess the that was a long answer to, you know, if, if something is well written, then it intrigues me. I mean, I, I, I do have a rule that I won't play people that do harm to children. Mm, interesting. I, I, I won't do that. Yeah. I draw I draw the line at that. And and um and I think, you know, for obvious reasons, because I'm a father. Yeah. But, um, you know, I approach my work um, and invest myself deeply in the work that I do. And those are, those are ideas and images that I don't want in my head. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's really interesting because talking to Ron Perlman about playing Clay in Sons of Anarchy... There was a point where he was experiencing the same, the, the, the thing that you're talking about where he didn't relate to this character anymore. Yeah. You know, he was responsible for a child's death. Yeah. The and, thing at the school that they had yep. to do. Yeah. Right. yeah. And he didn't even want to play him for a while because of the way the yeah. writing went. Are you concerned about that with Bosch at all? That it'll go into a direction that you may not agree with? No. I, I, no, not at all. Because that character, I mean, I, I told you guys, I was just finishing recording the, well, I think it's like the 23rd book. Yeah. Um, Coming out in October. And the, yeah, and that's, and he's a guy who's got a, you know, he will, he will um, approach things in a circuitous manner, but he's, he has a really good moral compass. Yes. He, he may bend the rules. I mean, it's in, in a, a few seasons ago, he, he, he put um, surveillance equipment to observe this guy that he knew was a serial killer but couldn't catch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a big no-no. And, and ultimately turned away. There was a moment when these guys pulled up in front of this guy's apartment complex, and it was clear that they meant they were coming to kill this guy. And Bosch turned away. Oh. He could have called. There was a moment where he picks up his phone to alert the cops. And some people construed it as him going, well, how am I going to explain these cameras? And it it wasn't about that. Mm -hmm. It was about him going, fuck it. Yeah. That's very Bosch to me, yeah. though. I yeah. mean, but that's, that's real because <laughs> yeah, it goes yeah. against his thing of everybody counts or nobody counts. Right. Uh -huh. But I think yeah. by the, 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 on the same level, to quote, uh, a, a character not from Bosch, but from Deadwood, Alice Waringen said, "There's just people in this world need killing." Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and I and, and I understood that. Um, do you and, agree it, with that? Yeah, I, I actually do because this is a guy who was who was deeply evil. He 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 raped, tortured, and murdered human beings. Yeah. yeah. So I kind of say. Anyone who commits those crimes, it's sort of... And I'm not some huge advocate for the death penalty, although I say in crimes against children, um, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, it's biblical, and I'm not a religious guy, mm -hmm. but I, I just draw the line, and hence the reason that I can't, I can't play those characters. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, but I don't think, no, I don't think he'll ever go down a path 
it would just be so uncharacteristic to to take that character yeah. down a road where you suddenly go, well, this is totally counter to every single thing this this character has done for all of these years. Right. Yeah, yeah, and you he's know. so well, well lined out with all the novels and everything. It's I don't I I also don't see that going that way. Well, it's that you know it's the Darth Vader thing. I mean mm -hmm. you know I mean as much as I did not love the prequels, yep. yeah, the the idea of pushing Anakin Skywalker to that place, you know, I was okay. Well, he killed sand people. They killed his mom. He yeah. killed sand people, kids. Not really okay with that. But when he went to the Jedi Temple and, and killed, killed the younglings, kids, I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, he's Darth Vader yeah, now. Yeah. Super Darth Vader. Yeah. So the play back to him... In the original films, when you get to Jedi and Luke says, I know that there's still good in him. Yeah. Was kind of like, really? really? Yeah. <laughs> Where? Where is that? <laughs> but but then because of the, you know, the, the beauty of the way that Luke, it's not like Lucas was able to bring a, a genuine redemption for that character. Yeah. yeah. But there was a glimmer of light that this guy could close in his life because it was his his connection to his son that that was able to bring some some of the light into his into his soul, into yeah. his being as someone who had been strong with the force. And hence had been, you know, seduced by the darks. So this, this is a whole other show that we'll no, have to do. No, this is the show. This is the show I'm in. No, and it, and it leads me to my next line of question: Is that you're very involved in the Marvel universe? Yeah. And I, and it, it, the answer seems pretty evident to me. To after seeing your place, but did the did being in the Marvel universe make you a fan of the Marvel Universe culture? Or were you already a fan before you became part of the Marvel universe? Oh, long before. Yeah. I mean, I I, I grew up. Um, on a steady diet of Marvel um, comics, I was a huge collector. Um, you know, even back then, the toys that were that were made, you know, didn't necessarily connect that much to me. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, there was the Mego stuff, which yeah. which was acceptable to me at the time because mm -hmm. that was the only option. Mm -hmm. The DC the DC stuff, some of it, and a few Marvel characters have been kind of well realized by the the Captain Action figure by Ideal. You had yeah. Spider Man, Sergeant Fury, Captain America. I think that was it I think for that the was it. Yeah. for the Marvel stuff. One of the greatest toys still in 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 my mind. You know. Um, being able to dress up this this figure as all your favorite yeah, heroes. Yeah. I mean, Steve Canyon and Buck Rogers was slightly lost on me because I was born in 1962. Right. Um, so I wasn't of the born in the 50s. It didn't necessarily resonate with me. Um, but I was a huge collector. I, I uh, and and a little bit of a I had sort of a savant, you know knowledge of marvel my my older brother he was six years older than i was he was a huge collector mm. and and marvel marvel changed it all i mean yeah. i i read superman and batman when i was a little boy and very shortly after that because my brother was older i read spider-man and saw the art of steve ditko and yeah. then suddenly it was kirby and fantastic four yep. and and I was consumed, and and my father, who was uh, not only a painter, but he was an he was an Ivy League academic, mm -hmm. would always kind of grouse at us, you know. Yeah, you always have your face in those goddamn comic books. They're 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 mindless. And I think he was sort of his experience had been that you know they were like the Sunday funnies. I mean, right. harmless, but not necessarily intellectually nurturing. Yeah. And my brother, in this kind of argument they had at one point. Handed my father a bunch of comics, Marvel comics, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, and something else. And he said, just just read these comics. It'll take you 20 minutes right. to read these. Just look at, look at them and tell me that they're dumb. And my dad came back and he said, yeah, these are... These are kind of deep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, and by the way, because my, my father always sort of... 
I don't want to say necessarily dismissed it. My mother was an illustrator, so my mother got Kirby and Gil Kane and, yeah. and also was a huge, loved Crazy Cat and, yeah. and Happy Hooligan and the original Tarzan stuff, Prince Valiant, um, Pogo, um, Little Nemo. These things were, my mother was enamored with these things because these were all great illustrators. Yeah. And my mother was kind of stunned um, by by Kirby. I mean, she used to make sort of jokes. She would say, yeah, the anatomy sometimes, they take huge <laughs> liberties with the anatomy, but she got it. Yeah. And my father after that never, never shit on comics again. And mm -hmm. he would sometimes say, I remember one time him saying to someone, I don't know what it was apropos, but he was having a conversation with another adult, and he said, yeah, my kids read uh, the Fantastic Four. Have you ever have you ever read any of those comics? It's it's lofty stuff, um, and it was. It yeah. is, and it became. I don't know. I, I you know, you, you 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 saw guys like, and there was always science that was applied to this heavy oh, yeah. science. Tons you know, the Hulk yeah. and Spider Man that, and Steve Rogers and yep. all these characters yeah. were affected by science whether it was whether it existed or not there was nothing stupid about it right and then it kind of and then for me i kind of trailed off in the as i got into high school i felt like marvel kind of dipped a little bit in the late yep. 70s i felt like some of, I, I was became disenchanted with some of the artwork that i was seeing i i was a real Ditko, Romita, Gil Kane, purist when it came to Spider-Man. I think Ross Andrew is it was is a great. He draws great stuff. Yeah. And and as I but I felt like this the villains got a little goofy yeah, and it got really Gwen Stacy's clone yeah, and, yeah. and the jackal and like mind worm. The language was weird too. It right? got dumb. Yeah. It got kind of dumb, but then there was still stuff that I was hot into. I mean, I loved I loved Mike Plug. Mm. You know, Plug just blew my socks off. I mean, yeah. Werewolf by Night Ugh. to me was I was like, really a werewolf comic? How are you going to make a comic about a werewolf? But it was Mike Plug so who I I loved all the stuff. He was drawing Man Thing and he was doing, you know, Marvel ventured out into the into the magazines for a while. Yep. Deadly Hands of Kung Fu was and still to this day, um I've got all my original Issues of Deadly Hands of Kung Fu. The Planet of the Apes series yeah. was great. Yeah, so good. I love that they had this original series drawn by Plug, and then they they would uh, they would recreate the the films. Yep. Um, it was just I don't know Marvel. It, it was a, on a different level. I mean, yeah. and it was just those guys. It was you know Stan Lee. Yep. And and all those and he brought together all these really gifted people and he yeah. created something and then I kind of you know then Marvel was doing a lot of adaptations of movies comic adaptations in the seventies and I wasn't you know and obviously you know you you're a teenager your you know your interest shifts from comics and toys to girls, girls yeah. and marijuana yeah. and beer and um. And then in the in the early '80s, I kind of ventured back, and that was the impetus to do that. Was somebody dropped the Dark Knight Returns oh, on yeah. me? It's a good one. And I looked at Frank Miller's writing and the artwork, and I went, "Oh, oh, yeah. what's this?" Yeah. And then went back to it, and and ironically, a lot of the the. Um, the stuff that I had read was had gotten a little was still a little goofy, West Coast Avengers and yeah. things like that. I couldn't really connect with that. Right. I kind of liked the X Men stuff, and then I ventured back a little bit with the Punisher War Journal series oh, yeah. and things like that. And then Romita Junior came on the scene. I went, well, that's that makes sense. The, you know that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, yeah. and yet there is nothing about his style that's even bears any resemblance to what his father did. Right. And, um, you know, once again, uh, the artwork got better. The, mm -hmm. the, um, the stories got, got really good. The art of, of Gene Colan also for me, and he was, of course, drawing stuff in the 60s. Um, 
the way he drew Daredevil, whenever Gene Colan's work came into play, it was filmic. I mean, I would look at that stuff. I mean, he would he would draw the the trajectory of a punch coming to hit, you know, a bad guy, or he would, you know, when he would draw Daredevil swinging, there was, there was, it had motion to it, and and the just his panels looked like yeah, like stills lifted from a film. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to the 80s, so then I, I sort of circled back, and then by the time the 90s kind of rolled in, it was, you had companies like Dark Horse and Eclipse kind of came on, so you had Savage Dragon, the really cool continuation of The Thing, which was one of my favorite movies, yeah. John Carpenter's oh, yeah. Thing, The yes. Thing from Another World, that stuff with the continuing adventures of MacReady, um, and obviously more adult content, whereas when I was a kid, you know, you got, you got your adult content from National Lampoon mm -hmm. uh, or Heavy Metal. Heavy Metal, yeah. Because Rich Corbin was, oh. and Mobius, I mean, you look back at the artwork of, of just to name a few, I mean, Ran Xerox and, uh, and uh, Milo Manara and, and all that stuff, which was, you know, some of it was quasi-pornographic, which, of course, gave me the impetus to want to look at it but it but it had that Frazetta feel who was oh, another yeah. guy I mean Frank Frazetta uh, was you know if I had the money and enough skin on my body I would just cover myself with with tattoos as a, a walking homage to Frank Frazetta oh gosh, because yeah. that was and that also before I became an actor I wanted to be a fine artist like my father and yeah. my mother and it was Marvel that really led me down that path and then I my mind got blown by the paintings of Frazetta and that was one thing that my father and I could not agree on he 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 recognized um the stimulation of the work of Frazetta but my father was a fine artist of a, a, a of a different mindset right yeah. you know and he couldn't he kind of poo-pooed the idea that I that I you know I thought well I I I want to be like Frazetta, and after an uneventful year of art school, in which I had had formal training with my father for years and was gonna was gonna proceed with with that, um, I I made the decision based on a conversation I had with my father to no longer be a painter, because my father said to me after a year of just kind of carousing and drinking and drugging in 1980 at, at Bennington College in Vermont, um, and my father, rightfully so, was pretty pissed off with me that I had, I didn't think I'd wasted a year of, oh, yeah. of my life. I, I, I still think it was one of the best years. Um, <laughs> but um, it was clear that I was kind of at sea yeah. and didn't have any discipline. And my father, you know, I was 19, and my father said, well, what is it that you, because I... I said, I'm going to join the Marine Corps because I felt maybe that would kind of straighten me out and give me focus. Mm. And my father said, well, before you do that, and you, you owe me one because you just pissed away a lot of money um, on a year of misbehaving. Although I didn't think it was misbehaving. Right. But anyway. Yeah. Um, and in, within that year's time, I was sort of... Um, one of, I mean, kind of held hostage by my father in which in that period I was, I was living alone. You know, at 19, I was living in this little Cape house out in the middle of the woods with no telephone and no electricity. And I was cutting firewood and living kind of like Thoreau and keeping a journal and reading a selection of books, which was a couple hundred books. And, you know, starting with Mesopotamia and working myself up to, you know, the complete works of of Proust and Chaw. I mean, it was one of the, it was, I, we, my brothers and I joke, uh, we call it inward bound where it was like, and then after that year, my father said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, but he said, do you still want to be a painter? And I said, well, I think so. To which he said, when you're not thinking about girls and beer, what do you think about? Do you think about painting? And I said, no, I don't. Mm. Well, what do you think about? And I said, I think about acting. And he said, well, then that's what you should do. Because wow. if, if, you, if you think about it, if it's what you must do, if you're going to pursue a life in the arts, you, you, you do it because you have to do it. Yes. Yes. Not because you think you're going to make a lot of money or become famous. Because many people 
take that road and never achieve even a modicum of recognition for their work, yeah. uh, let alone make any money. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he said, well, there's, you know, the only thing to do is to, is to go back to New York, which is what I did. I mean, I got on a Greyhound bus and went back to New York with, you know, a couple hundred dollars in my pocket and, you know, flopped on people's couches until I got enough jobs to pay rent and get my own place and, and study acting. And that's what I did. That's, that was that. Where do you think the impetus for wanting to be a performer came from? Where, where, where did that kind of come into your psyche? Like, because you were kind of pursuing the idea, oh, I might, I think I want to be a painter, you know, for, for a little bit there, but where did it come? Because uh, that is a tough thing for a lot of people to want to, you know, embody a a character or to perform for an audience or whatever. Where did that come from? Well, it was always in me to a certain degree. I mean, I certain, my parents were both cinephiles. And so, you know, I grew up going to the movies Mm. all the time. And of course is that, that, long predates VHS. I mean, but I went to the movies every weekend. If it wasn't going to see a new movie, it was going to film festivals at University of Pennsylvania where they would show the complete works of Chaplin over a weekend or Buster Keaton or Akira Kurosawa, um, John Ford, Howard Hawks. Yes. Um, So I, as a young kid, I had this sort of odd encyclopedic knowledge of film. Um, and I was always intrigued by, by watching actors do these things. And I, and I did, you know, I mean, I did, I did theater and there was a, a a filmmaker slash painter named Rudy Burkhardt who used to make these films. And they were, the people who acted in these films were all well-known artists like my father and Alex Katz and Red Grooms and the poet John Ashbery and... These, these films were populated by non-actors. They mm-hmm. were all painters or poets yeah. or sculptors. Yeah. So the first one I ever did, I think I was four or five, and I had a scene where the poet and dance critic Edwin Demby, had, who was the stingiest and richest man in the world, had stolen a penny which had fallen out of my pocket, and I had a little scene where I realized that he had stolen my penny and I had to kind of jump all over him, and, and, and it was fun. Yeah. And then I did... I did um, I did plays in high school, and then I had a summer right before I went away to boarding school. My mother was living in Boston at the time, and because I didn't, I didn't live there and I didn't go to school there, my mother lived right in the center of Boston, I didn't have any friends. I didn't, I didn't know anybody. And so my time was spent either watching television, you know, reading comics and listening to music, or walking to the multiplex, which was two blocks away. Yeah. And my mother came one day and she said, you know, I'm, I really don't want you, I don't want you to spend your summer doing this. And so I've signed you up for some acting classes at a place called the Actors Workshop in Boston. It doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's just like a block away from Fenway Park. And I went <coughs> and it was like a three week thing. And I would go every day from say nine till one in, in the afternoon. And we workshop these plays and then we perform them for mm-hmm. a small audience at the end of the summer. And I, I, that was really the, the moment when I kind of thought I, I could, I see myself doing this. And I was also a mimic as a kid, but mm-hmm. I, again, you know, I did, I did cartoon voices and things that I saw on television. Right. Um, but a lot of the impressions that I did were of artists and poets and screenwriters, because those were the people that I was surrounded by. Right. Yeah. So I, I did a mean Red Grooms, but only people <laughs> in the art world knew who Red Grooms yeah. was, right? Yeah. So it was... And then as I got older, you know, I, I, it sort of evolved a bit in, into Brando and Pacino and mm-hmm. Walken and, and things like that. But so it all kind of came full circle. So when, when my father said that to me, it, it, the, the, the switch went off and then, you know, then it's the dog years of, of, uh, you know, I went to, I yeah. was at the HB studios and then I went, I kind of need to, I wanted to go back to school, um, and not only get a conservatory type of training, but also 
do academics because I wanted to have, because I was curious about other things in the world, I wanted to have some intellectual right. breadth. Yeah. Um, and not just be some, you know, dipshit actor who would sit and, and talk about the craft of acting, which, <laughs> right. I, which I honestly find sort of boring. Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably, it may be interesting on some level to the layman. And I'm not saying that it doesn't have value. Yeah. Right. But I think if you talk to a plumber and said, so when you're hanging out with your plumber colleagues, are you guys talking about you know, Pipes. pipe fitting and things <laughs> yeah. like that? And they go, no, we talk about <laughs> football and, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, so, okay. This is the question we come to on every show. And uh, through it all, through your career, which has blossomed into hundreds of uh, over 100 roles now, um, and uh, being able to play a myriad of different characters, what fuels you to keep going? What fuels you to wanting to keep creating and to keep, you know, be, becoming that actor? Because it's fun. Mm. That's a great answer. I mean, that's just the, that's the truth of it. It's fun. There isn't anything else in the world I'd rather do. I mean, I'm a painter as well. Mm -hmm. These are yep. my paintings. Oh, nice. and, I, and I love painting. But painting is, there's a, there's a depth and, uh, of solitude to that. Yes. Where yeah. the, the relationship is between myself and a blank canvas and, and nature because of what I paint is my muse. Um, but it's lonely. It's, yeah. it's very lonely. And I love people. And um, I also, I play music. Mm -hmm. And in my family, everyone played an instrument. And so um, my older brother and I had rock bands, but my father was a five-string banjo player. And we grew up um, on a steady diet of bluegrass music. And so we played bluegrass. So yeah. after dinner, my father would say, you want to rip a couple of tunes? And oh, that's so cool. My brother was a great bluegrass flat picker. And I briefly played the mandolin, but I sang and I played harmonica. And so after dinner every night, we played music. So music was also, once again, I mean, I think it all kind of comes back to that connection with other people. Yeah. And to me, you know, it's like when you're observing musicians and or if you're playing music with a group of musicians. And, and it's, I, I call it being in the glove when suddenly it all connects and you find yourself with an involuntary smile on your face. And that to me is the essence of joy yes. in the creation of art. It's inexplicable. Yes. yes. It's just inexplicable. And, and when I get to sit across a table and, and play a scene with another actor who's invested in the same way mm -hmm. and who acts the same way that I do, which is not to service myself entirely but to service the other actor I sit across from in the process of taking the attention off of myself and putting it on the other person and that which you see the performance that occurs because you're giving completely of yourself to this other person yeah that resonates and that's when I get that involuntary smile across yeah. my face yeah because it's there's a connection there that that I mean yeah technically I can explain it to you chapter and verse but but the joy of it, the fun of it, is inexplicable. And that's why I love doing it. And we'll never go, you know, people say, oh, well, when I retire or when you retire. And I say, what are you, I, I, aren't, I'm not going to retire. No. I mean, what would I do? Well, it's great. Typically, it's when they go, oh, so when you retire from acting, you'll go back to painting. And I go, no, I, I, I paint and I act. You can do two um, things at once. You know, something, <laughs> you know, my painting gets shelved a little bit. Yeah. When I'm when I'm busy working, because there's also the reality that that I have a family to support yep. mm -hmm. and and bills to pay, like everybody else in the world, and um, there there are jobs that are in the service of art, and sometimes in 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 the you know in the service of commerce and survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's it's fun, and and to simplify it even more, and, and uh, not to degrade it. Um, because I, I so often, actors get so defensive about, about things, to which, you know, I say, lighten up. It all goes back to dress up and to role playing yeah. and to imagination. 
that which we did as kids. The yeah. same thing that we we did as children when we drew on on a piece of paper yeah. or we took our G.I. Joes or our major Matt Masons or our Legos and we and, and took our toy guns or, or, or capes or whatever we had. You know, you tied a a fucking, you know, beach towel around your neck yeah. and jumped off your bed onto the ground. And, it, and in those moments, yeah. you were, you fully embodied that which connected to your, to your sense of play, to your yeah. sense of imagination. And that's, you know, uh, in, in, in the simplest of terms, that for me is what acting is. It's living truthfully in imaginary circumstances. For me, what could be more fun than that? Yeah. yeah. It's fun. You know, it's also a shitload of hard work. Uh -huh. The hours are long. Mm -hmm. They're sometimes they're ridiculously long. Um, and that part of it is not always fun. You get tired. Yeah. You get hungry. You get cranky. And sometimes you get bored. There's a lot of time. There's a lot of downtime mm -hmm. in between. And, and, you know, and the way you sort of sustain and navigate that is when you're working with a great group of people who you respect and love, other actors and producers and writers and your crew, you become this sort of circus-like organization. You become family in that period of time when you're shooting, you... You form, you know, not always so much on with movies because, but in that period, in the process of making that film, you you make connections and and relationships that are that can be lifelong. Yeah, yeah. and and that's the thing that uh, you know that that gets you. It's it's storytelling. You learn you learn people's you learn people's stories. And for me, you know, I I I I have the the great privilege of being able to travel all over the place uh -huh. meet people from all different parts of the world some of them we all have really really different life experiences but you meet other people and 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 i love people and i love to observe people that's part of my whole process as an actor is mm -hmm. I, I i say you know sometimes i get these i get cornered by young actors and they and they want the answers and i say i got no answers for you you keep your head down you keep your head down and you persevere and, and, and you got to be disciplined. It doesn't mean you can't have a life and you can't have fun, but the journey you've, you've, you've chosen this journey. So if you want to be rich and famous, then become a YouTuber and, and hope for the best, right? Mm -hmm. you know, become a Kardashian. Um, it's fleeting. Right. And that contribution, which you're bringing is, is, is not substantive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people would argue and say, well, entertainment is entertainment. Even, even what you do, Titus, isn't substantive. You're just doing make-believe. And I go, yeah, you're right. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, a medical research person who's going to come up with a cure for a disease. I'm not going to, to come up with a fuel source that's going to rid us of our dependence on, on petroleum products. Right. But if I can make you smile or I can scare you or I can move you or I can make you think for just a moment, and have you depart from that experience of having witnessed something that 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 I have been a part of with a, with another group of people and it's moved you? Then I have done my job. Yes, yeah. and that's all that it is. That's all that it is. I my my life is not in danger, you know. Right. Uh, but that which which we do in the arts, the same as painting and music and. And, and, and acting and entertaining and filmmaking lasts forever. Yes. It lasts forever. Yes. You know, long before the three of us are gone, people will still be listening to the Beatles yep. and they'll still be looking at the works of Picasso. Mm -hmm. They'll still be watching Scorsese films mm -hmm. and Kurosawa films and silent films. Yeah. Um, they'll still be listening to classic music and... And, and reading, you know, books of, you know, reading Michael Connolly's books. Totally. And, and Tolkien and yeah. reading Marvel comics. And, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, there is certain stuff. And it's not people, you know, they, they, they diminish it at times. And they say, particularly, you know, pop culture gets kind of a, gets a bump. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's, people will turn their noses up and say, well, it's pop culture. 
Well, yeah, but we still, people are still putting posters. Kids are still putting posters up on their walls. Yeah. You know, it may not be Farrah Fawcett and Peter Max, but... You know, now it's uh, it's it's the Deftones and right. and and Michael Jackson and whatever. You yeah. know, the Rolling Stones. You know, I went to see Hall and Oates with my wife and my son a couple of weeks ago. How was that? It was amazing. Yeah, I bet. I saw those guys over the years quite a few times in the seventies and the eighties. Um, and Daryl Hall is seventy-one years old, mm-hmm. and Hall and Oates. I gotta say, the show was amazing. They still play like they got something to prove. Yeah. They're still those guys from Philly that know they, you know, but they play from their hearts because yeah. it goes back to the thing. It's fun. Yes. Yeah. And when you watch them play, they're having fun. Yeah. They're happy. And that's, to me, is what that's all about. That's, yeah. That's inspiring. Well, I feel like if everybody's doing that, if everybody's doing the thing that makes them happy and they're just influencing everybody around them. We'll all rise together. I think so. And that's always, you know, and particularly in the climate that we're living in right now where there's, there, it, there's such despair, you mm-hmm. know, there's, there's so much hatred and, 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 and ugliness that, and, and I have to think of it, you know, when, when people go, cause I've gone down the rabbit hole of just being kind of depressed by the state of things. Yeah. But then I say, well, you know what? The upside of that is that because people who are, are filled with hatred and fear and ignorance have been emboldened by this administration, it's okay because now we see these people. Mm-hmm. We can identify them and, and call them out for, for what they are. Yeah. And... Um, and I think that, that that has its own positive effect. And, I, and, and yeah. um, as ugly and saddening as it is, uh, it's always been there. You yeah. know, it's like when people say this, this pandemic thing of black men being shot and killed by the police and, or, or, you know, constantly being misidentified as, as criminals. And I say, it's not... It's not pan- it, it's been pandemic for forever since the beginning of time. The difference is we everyone has a video camera on their phone now. Yeah. Right? And so it's being documented. Right. And that's the only difference. Yeah. Black men have been been shot and and murdered and hung and abused and and the in the Indians, the 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 original Americans, yeah. for lack of a better term, they were here first. Yeah. Okay. So we're the illegal aliens. Of yeah. All of us. But we we uh, without getting you know heavily political, just to speak to that, I you know I think now more than ever, I think it's one of the reasons why a film like La La Land got so much attention. Mm-hmm. Because we're being bombarded daily with all of this ugliness yeah. and stuff that, frankly, is really frightening. Not yeah. just from a societal point of view. That's really disheartening. But the environment and what's going on on around us, it's frightening. It yeah. is. And people, you know, people don't want to go see movies. I don't want to go see Geostorm. Yeah. I don't want to. That's not entertaining to right. me. It's terrifying. This isn't. This isn't the seventies. Yeah. You know the Irwin Island disaster films had were were escape because the Vietnam War was going on and right. we didn't want to go see war movies because it was on the six o'clock news with right. Walter Cronkite every night. So we wanted to go see movies about ninety foot tidal waves flipping a luxury liner. You know, and yeah. and it was an adventure. And and now people they want singing and dancing. Yeah, they want something that's going to take them away from the day in day out. Yeah, and in the same way that we've overcome all these other things throughout yeah. history, wars and, yeah. and 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 disease, and genocide, and genocide, yeah. all this. Um, you know, the human race is resilient, and there is a lot of goodness on the earth that that will allow us to to move beyond and grow and survive, uh, not without casualties. Yeah. yeah. History, history has, you know, provided us with the highest body count we could possibly imagine. Mm-hmm. But, but I, I, you know, 
we all it, it, it's hope right yeah. yeah and and uh and i think if anything if if it gives us all pause to to stop in a moment things that we take for granted that that, that might even seem innocuous um that has weight and gravity to it. I find now that it interesting if you say hello to a person, a lot of people will just walk by if you say hi or you open a door for someone and they just walk in, they don't say thank yeah. you. Yeah. But in those moments when somebody stops, and it's not like you do that for recognition. To me, it's just muscle memory. I was yep. raised properly by my Same parents to, to treat people with respect and to be courteous. Same. And when someone stops and they genuinely seem almost a little bit knocked off balance by a gesture of kindness and they say thank you with a question mark yeah <laughs> and you go you're welcome in that moment that 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 nanosecond of connection with another human being i go yeah we'll be okay yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a pendulum and it swings both ways yeah. and i think every time it swings things get a little bit better and i just think we're just on this weird swing right now and uh you know it gives good people a, a damn good reason to speak up. I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, the other, I think one of the things, the fuel for all of this, of course, alas, is a good cup of death wish coffee. There it is. In the morning. <laughs> there it is. Because not only, <laughs> not only does it have the highest caffeine Do tell. count <laughs> on the planet and it's organic and it's clean it doesn't, since since people are want to use the word fake, it's not fake coffee. Yeah, it's real coffee that hasn't been perverted by by pesticides and and flavors and and all sorts of stuff. Uh, I think now more than ever, people need to be <laughs> really need to be alert. Yeah. They need to be awake. Yeah, and who better than Death Wish Coffee? To, to to keep us all on the righteous pathway, right? I love For, it. I love it. Well, how, how many how many cups of coffee you do consume in a day? Well, you, see, now that. you put me. You're compromising me because if I if I say no, because well, there's seven, no wrong, there's no then people answer. go. He's clearly got a problem with coffee. <laughs> and if I say well one, they go well maybe that coffee's not so great. No, I, you know the the thing about that which which death wish coffee does, which is what I just said. It's I I don't like putting. Bad stuff, and it doesn't mean that I that that I that I won't go out and eat ice cream, right? Yeah. That, well, it, yeah. you know, uh, you know, or on the on the odd occasion have an annual In and Out burger with animal fries or something. Mm. It was amazing, by the way. It was our first experience Which, in In and Out, and amazing. it ain't bad. It ain't, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's not a lot bad. of flavor. I didn't know where it was coming from. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, that's the thing. Nobody knows you where, don't it, know where it's coming from. It, it, could, it might be yoga mats and athletic socks. But that's it, okay with But me. in the moment, it tastes good. Yeah. But you know, when you the. the it's interesting, and I think for me, it's sort of it, it's it's reinventing the wheel to a certain degree. And what 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 Death Wish has done is it's kind of gone back to the recipe of it ain't broke, so there's no need to fix it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when you create a product, particularly now because people are tired of putting bad shit in their bodies and totally. or having, you know, we all have that's an option, right? If yeah. you if you wanna. Drink Starbucks, and you know sometimes you have to do that in a pinch. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, the first time I had Death Wish coffee, um, and we thank Andy Smith for that because yes. he's the one that that got me, turned me on to you guys. Um, it's it, it's kind of like, you know, when you drink something and it's good, and you go. This is really, really good, and it's good for you. You kind of go, well, that, that's sort of a no-brainer right. to me. Yeah. And so, my thing is that when I find something that's great, um, you know, I should walk around like like the the race car drivers. You know, they have all the, the endorsement <laughs> patches on, on there. Because I, I, I am. We can send I, you some patches. No, I, I am. Well, you better. I, I, I mean, I I'm, I kind of become like you know a stock car racer. Yeah. Because I'm always flying the flag. If I'm not wearing a Death Wish coffee shirt, I got my coffee and comics and my and my. Uh, my my favorite Death Wish shirt, of course, is is my um, spin on the on the Masters of Reality. Yes, because um, I'm a huge Sabbath fan. 
So that was that was the one I had to have. Oh yeah. But the first time I wore my Death Wish shirt out in public, somebody thought it was a joke. They just thought they always do. Oh, that's that's kind of a that's kind of a funny yeah because everyone we're such a coffee culture now yeah mm-hmm. and and somebody said oh that's a really funny shirt where'd you get it I said oh from well from Death Wish Coffee you don't know about Death Wish Coffee they didn't know and then of course they they were probably sorry that they they asked me because then I I, I had to, I went on my whole thing <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah about the virtues of Death Wish Coffee yeah but that to me is. You know, we live in the world of information, um, and you have to represent. You have to represent properly. And everybody who I turn on to Death Wish Coffee, you know, it's the same thing as, you know, I'm sure, you know, the first time I turned my kids on to Hendrix, I, re- I remember my son saying, I really like Jimi Hendrix. And I went, yeah, because it's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. It's the truth. Well, we're really happy that you enjoy it and, and in turn have turned other people onto it, like everybody uh, you know who's working on the incredible show Bosch and all that. And um, we can't Well yeah, it. I gotta I gotta interrupt you there and just say it, it, it Death Wish is the coffee of Bosch. <laughs> Which is incredible to hear. And you know My Amazon really Amazon Amazon sells a shitload yes. of Death Wish products. Yes. Number one selling coffee on Amazon. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, it, I, I hate the word no-brainer, but it's but sort of it, it's sense, sort man. of a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. It's, yes. a, it's a marriage made um, perfectly. And we can't be happier to, to hear that. And we can't be happy enough to have you on the show and, and have you sit down and welcome us into your home and talk to you. Um, for Finally, for our viewers and our listeners, um, what's the best way for them to follow you, for to follow your journey? Um, well, I, I, I do Twitter. And, okay. And I do Twitter. Um, I don't remember my Twitter handle off the top of my head. Um, we'll I'll put it, in. I'll we'll put it, put it right, right in the show. You, yeah, so. you, you pop it in there. Yep. Um, I, I do my Twitter. Nobody else does nice. my Twitter. Um, same with my Instagram. I have a private in, Instagram um, account, well, that which in. is just for my buddies. But then yep. I also have another one, which is... Uh, Titus Welliver official on Instagram. Okay. That's and I monitor that. Nobody else does that. Excellent. Um, my Facebook is private, but I follow you guys on Facebook. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, that's uh, I, I'm better about it sometimes than others. Certainly, when when I'm involved with the project, you know, when we're shooting Bosch, I'm I'm posting pictures and kind of cluing. Yeah. I try not to give too much away. Yeah. I mean, that's the hardest part about doing Bosch because we're we're you know, the source material are books that everyone has read. Mm -hmm. Um, But since we don't follow the books chronologically, we kind of reconfigure, sometimes um, connect two books. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, so I just try to keep people, you know, informed and and stimulated with with images from the show. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I, you know, just a shout out to the the fans of, of Bosch, you know, thank you for all the support. You know, we are a 10-episode season. Um, we're this this part of this brave new world of streaming, which I think is no longer necessarily just the brave new world. Right. It's it's the world it's, that we live in. Yeah. I don't yeah. know about you guys, but I'm, you know, if I'm not watching other prime video shows, I'm, I'm on Hulu and mm-hmm. Netflix. I'm a huge Stranger Things fan. Fanatic, yes. um, you know my. Was oh, that the shirt? Oh yeah! yeah. Oh, no, this, this, is the, this, is the, this is the arcade. Was, I just got that reference. I can't believe I didn't get that earlier. I don't Shame know if you guys me. have watched it, but I've been yes. shouting out um, to people about uh, this new shoe uh, show on Hulu, um, Castle, Castle Rock, Castle Rock, yes. which is yeah, the so good. serious, serious crack, and I and I think you know, like like Stranger Things, one of the most original, totally. Interesting things. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's be truthful. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Stephen Quin- uh, Stephen King, by you know, certainly mm-hmm. read comic books. Totally. Um, you yeah. know, his books have inspired and influenced. Obviously, not you know, Castle Rock is his thing. Um, you know, Dustin Thomas and you know, uh, and those guys have taken all of his his material and, and melded it into this universe that yeah. just doesn't quit um and i'll say also for the 
for those who do not know um, the collected works of Stephen King, my wife being one of them, I turn her on to Castle Rock. We've been been watch it's great because i what i do is i watch it and then i go back and re-watch the stuff with her nice. um i've watched the first six episodes of castle rock three times through <laughs> stranger things i've done both seasons five times through nice um i think we'll be talking about these once again i think these shows will fall into americana in the same way that all in the family and nypd blue uh, and mission impossible hawaii five oh you know, whatever, Carol Burnett show, yeah. um, X Files. Um, you notice that I'm 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 veering away from anything that I participated in. Um, <laughs> you, I, wait I don't wanna, you were in the X Files. I don't want to get. Oh, I did. That's right. I, was I, did. Say, I, like, I, uh, I did. Oh well. <laughs> so much for humility. <laughs> but Duchovny, well, he'll thank me for that. Um, you know, there's. Uh, yeah, my wife, who uh, has never read a Stephen King book, she doesn't like spooky stuff, is completely enthralled and consumed by... She's not the target audience, and right. yet it's undeniable. And same thing with Stranger Things. She was like, oh, I don't like that spooky stuff. Well, she's in. Now, yeah. I, you know... I know we have to save something for the next yes. the next show because yes. this is for those of you listening and watching this is a two parter yes for sure for sure because we're definitely going to have you back could on be the a show. three or four parter exactly I'm as, okay with that as long as they'll have me oh, and we'll there's coffee and evidence I'll always be back we'll, we'll have you back all the time and I just again I could talk to you for hours I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk with us because uh, um, when it really comes down to it. I think something that this world is severely lacking is just the art of conversation and, and the art of, of, you know, bringing joy to everybody. And I, and I think, you know, with your career, that's what you do. And I think we try to impart that as well. And, yeah. and when we can all kind of meet in the middle, it's, it's some kind of magic. Yeah, well, there's kind of, you know, I always believe that because we don't have Johnny Carson and Merv Griffin and the Mike Douglas show, and sometimes mm -hmm. those shows could be, Silly and whatnot, but right. I think you know you guys as as you get you know podcasts the you know streaming this is a whole new thing and yes. people people don't want to watch you know late night with Jimmy Fallon I mean right. and, and I get it those things are they're Contrived. entertainment and they're fun and you know you guys want to entertain but you know this 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 what you do is something for everybody yes. so and and I think you know. My hat's off to you guys. Thank uh, you. My Death Wish coffee hat's off to you guys <laughs> uh, because uh, we need we need more. So just keep doing what you're doing, and, and the privilege has absolutely been mine. So thank you for having me on. Thank you. Thank it's you. been really really fun. Yeah. Cheers, man. Awesome. Thank, cheers, you. Titus. thank you. Cheers. This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Death Wish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>